The Lord be with you. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. From wherever you are watching us, listening to us, know that you are welcome. Our worship is open to all, and we are most grateful for your presence and your participation with us today. Our worship will feature uh, something special, special to the first Sunday in each month here at First Presbyterian, and that is we will celebrate communion together. So if you missed uh, an announcement about that sometime earlier in the week, I invite you to press pause and then go and find uh, a, a chalice or something of, of juice or wine or anything that you might have, even water if that's all you've got, and find a piece of bread, put it down in the central uh, space where you are gathered either by yourself or with friends and family. And at that time later in our worship, we will celebrate the sacrament together. Our own Amy Backstrom, our Director of Family Ministries, is going to be on these next Sundays, starting this morning at about 9 o'clock uh, and the next two or three weeks to come, a hosting breakfast for our children and youth Sunday school classes. So know that you can come. It will be outside. We'll be masked and distanced. Uh, in all of that, but just to be able to be close to one another and see each other's faces. I'm grateful to Amy for doing this. So put the word out uh, among those you know who have uh, children and young people, and let us gather together. A week from today, Sunday the 13th, is what we call Rally Day. It's the first, uh, it's the opening service, if you will, of our program year. Uh, the um, Various teams and committees and groups uh, have been invited to put together video snippets of the ministries they do, the mission and all the good work they do. And our own Rachel King, director of children's music, who's up in the booth recording us even now, will stitch all of those together. And we will have a sense, uh, as part of our worship next week, that the year has begun, even under these circumstances, the ministry and mission of First Presbyterian goes on. The beautiful flowers that you will see beside the pulpit are given today by Helena, Will, and Eric Gasteyer in celebration and honor of wife and mother, Anne. So to Anne we say, happy birthday. Let us now prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning. You may have heard of the three B's of classical music, Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. This morning you'll hear from two of the three, no Beethoven unfortunately today. For the prelude, uh, Siciliano, which is the second movement of a flute sonata by J.S. Bach, beautifully transcribed for the organ. For the musical offering today, uh, the German communion chorale, Schmucke dich, which in English translates as, deck thyself my soul with gladness leave behind all gloom and sadness. And finally, for the postlude today, perhaps Bach's most famous fugue, his little fugue in G minor, although with Bach, nothing musical is ever truly little. In this case, that's to distinguish from his later larger works. Um, if you're not familiar with a fugue, it's a more uh, formal version of the rounds you may have sung as a child. First, you'll hear the soprano voice enter in G minor and then the alto with the same tune in D minor, and the tenor back in G minor, and finally the pedal bass part in D minor. Bach summed up the art of the fugue so grandly within his lifetime and showed us what's truly possible in that musical art form. Thank you.
Good morning. I invite you to join me in our call to worship. How shall we live in the love of God? We will treat one another with fairness and dignity. How shall we witness to God's forgiving love? We will reach out to others with compassion. Come, let us worship God who has always loved us. Let our worship of God be reflected in our lives of hope and peace. Let us pray. <clears throat> Loving God, we come this day to worship and to thank you for the many ways you guide our lives. We also come seeking your healing presence in our lives. Help us always to be open to you and give us the courage to let your love be our way in the world, our way of relating to each other. Amen. Please pray with me in our prayer of confession. God, our hope and refuge, the way of Jesus teaches us to let our anxieties go and trust in your goodness. Yet our human natures want to be in control. We yearn for security or the illusion of it. We shun vulnerability. Hear us as we pray for healing and wholeness for ourselves and our relationships. Lead us in the ways of compassion and justice and peace. Grant us the confidence of faith that nothing can separate us from you through the loving example of Jesus of Nazareth. Gracious God, hear our prayers. Amen. God does not abandon us in our fear. God comes to us. God journeys with us. And God can be trusted even when all seems lost. Friends, receive this good news. We are forgiven and restored. Be at peace with God and with one another. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Hello. So if you have been with us in our regular worship time before we were in quarantine, you know that we do the passing of the peace where an adult or a youth or somebody stands up and says, the peace of Christ be with you. And we respond and also with you. But I heard at our first um, um, soft opening last week that we had that it's hard to hear people with a mask on. It's hard to see people smiling with a mask on. So we had decided to come up with some creative ways that we can share the peace of Christ with others. So I've had some friends here to help me. And so we've just come up with a couple things that we can do to each other if we're ever out in, in public and you want to pass the peace of Christ with, on with somebody from far away, here's how you can do it. Hudson, the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. And maybe they're so far away that they can't hear. All you have to do is. So there's a simple thing that you can do. Let's see what else we can do. Here's something else we can do. Callan, the peace of Christ be with you. But maybe he can't hear me. So I could simply do this. Let's see what else. Here's another thing we could do. Sophia, the peace of Christ be with you. Or maybe this. Sophia, the peace of Christ be with you. So that if we're far away and she can't hear me, I can just do, and she can do, back. The peace of Christ be with you this week. Six years ago, during my first summer here in Worcester, the periodical Presbyterians Today, an official publication of our denomination, ran a cover article entitled, Civil Rights, Miles to Go, with these following 
subtitled articles. Presbyterians still march for justice and Katrina, the cost of being poor and black. Reading those articles, I wondered if uh, we were back in 2005 with Katrina or in 1965 at the heart of the civil rights campaign. This past Saturday, many of our fellow Worcester citizens gathered on the downtown square to remember and celebrate Martin Luther King Jr.'s March on Washington and his iconic speech, I Have a Dream, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, and to remember the life and legacy of the late John Lewis. That was 57 years ago, and it made me realize that much is yet to be done to bring every American of whatever skin color, age, gender, sexual orientation, social and economic state of life into the full actualization of our constitutional claim that all are created equal and endowed by our creator with the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Hearkening back to 1963 in our summer of 2020, a time of racial civil awareness and action stemming from the violent murders of George, George Floyd and a continuing list of others by police forces in a number of cities, committed citizens for racial justice are demanding systemic change. The main points of the article in Presbyterians Today are not so much the details of the Katrina weather disaster, but how its aftermath dealt so harshly with the poor populations of color that were left behind or forced to be displaced. Given these harsh realities and so many more horrific scenarios from across our globe and displayed nightly on our television screens or on our computers, along with various partisan commentaries, the question I am left with is this. Can our biblical texts offer a word of solace or wisdom or even hope? Matthew's prescription for maintaining the integrity of his community, which I think is the intention of today's text, is to remind us that we are one, that we should work together to, man to maintain the integrity of our common calling, to follow the way of Christ in word and deed. With that in mind, Matthew would speak to the Katrina world of 15 years ago and to the more recent violence closer to home and to the next devastations of our world tomorrow. More locally, though less dramatically, Matthew would speak to our first Presbyterian church community this morning and in the mornings to come as we strive to live with discernment into our future life and ministry together. In that spirit, let us hear with ears and minds and hearts these words from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20, and Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you 
you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let alone, let such a one be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two or three of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Jesus speaks of mutual connections and responsibilities in this passage from Matthew. And his words come even more pointedly to, com to communities like ours which can also suffer from a lack of mutual trust. Jesus' words in Matthew 18, 15 and following demonstrate that conflict was present from the beginning of the church. And Jesus' words are clear about how we should manage and confront our conflicts with honesty, with mutual respect, with truth in love. To do otherwise is to count ourselves, as Matthew so colorfully puts it, Gentiles and tax collectors. That is, to consider ourselves to be outside the body of Christ. We are in this relationship together. Joys and crises are shared by communities. Our baptismal vows have called us to a higher purpose, a higher standard of mutual compassion, mutual forgiveness, mutual discipleship, mutual respect, mutual striving for the peaceable kingdom with God. When we have disputes and disagreements, Jesus mandates that we speak with one another, that we come face to face as children of God and members of the body of Christ to articulate the dispute, the difference, the disagreement, the potential division, and to make every effort to reconcile and resolve for the sake of the peace of Christ we seek to embody. Our baptismal vows bind us together we are all beloved and unconditionally graced to be by Holy Spirit, Christ's own forever. Therefore, we act, we do differently. And by these profoundly different ways of being in community together, the world will know we are the body of Christ. The world will know we are Christians by our love. This is how the Apostle Paul says it in his epistle to the Romans, chapter 13, verses 8 to 10. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor 
as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. We come today to the table of grace. The table we say is, and I hope, the table we trust to be set before us by the God of grace. The Apostle Paul articulated that we are no longer Jew or Greek, insider or outsider, no longer different from one another in the eyes of God. Instead, we are sons and daughters of God, each unique and each beloved and each invited to lay down our burdens, lay down our prejudices, lay down our gains and our losses, lay down our distrust and our anger, lay down our fear and anxiety. The passage from Romans puts it this way, love for one another is the fulfilling of the law. Before we jump to all that binding and loosing on earth and in heaven that Matthew's text mentions, let us remember that here today we are to or three, gathered together in the name of Jesus. We are gathered across our differences, across our mistrusts, across our fears and anxieties, and we also are gathered around our mutual stories, our shared experiences, our deep and abiding friendships, as we heard in Matthew's gospel, being gathered here together in Jesus' name means the spirit of Jesus is among us. May we trust this promise and share the table of our Lord together. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Amen.
A table has been set for us, a place, a space has been reserved for you. You are welcome here. All are welcome here. This is not a table that is fenced out by theology or polity. No, this is the table of grace set with the gifts of God for this whole people of God. So come, be renewed so that you may go out with joy. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. God of fresh bread and new wine, we sense your presentness among us in grace-filled moments of sharing, in diverse communities of loving compassion, in holy times of birthing new life amid the world's suffering. We delight in the moving of your steadfast spirit, demanding that we find water for the thirsty, demanding that we prepare meals for all who hunger, and encouraging us to welcome all in our midst. As we share this meal, may we be nourished by the memory of Jesus and his friends who dared to feed those whom no one else would feed, who included the sinners that society shunned and oppressed, who drew healing energy out of people past hope of healing, who heard the cries of people dried up and desperate and nourished them with living water and life-giving bread. This daring community uplifted the power of justice and righteousness. This daring community embraced those who were searching, longing and aching for acceptance and love. Holy One, we remember the life and death of Jesus and the many committed faithful people then and now who have kept alive the memories of fresh bread, new wine, and living water, prepared and blessed and shared with all. May our lives give birth to your healing power in us and among us that turns water into wine, bear tables into feast, outsiders into beloved friends. This is the bread of compassion and hope. This is the cup of blessing and new life. These are the signs of love for the community of hope. Hear our thankful prayers and hear us now as we pray that ancient prayer that Jesus taught his followers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We remember that on the night of his arrest, sitting with friends, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant 
sealed in me and poured out for you. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim God's compassionate grace and love to the ends of time. At this time, I invite you to break your own bread and share it. Take your own cup and share that as well. And say to one another, the bread of hope, the cup of healing and wholeness for all things, the gifts of God, for the whole people of God. And we respond by saying, thanks be to God. Let us pray. divine presence, in all of life we give thanks for the gift of love that reaches into our hearts, for the refreshment of this sacred food that renews us, for the stories of Jesus and his passion for hospitality and justice. May we be refreshed and renewed to live faithfully and boldly with deep compassion and integrity for the sake of all creation. Amen. Back in the 1960s, a parish priest on the south side of Chicago was leading marches and vigils in support of civil rights. And he needed a song to have his people sing at those times. And not finding one, he wrote this song himself. And I first learned it as a young teenager at summer Bible camp. And that may well be uh, something that happened to many of you, that you learned this song back in the 60s or the 70s in my case. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. And we'll guard human dignity and save human pride. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. And at the end of the day, that's all we've got. All we've got is doing the best we can to walk with God, to walk hand in hand, side by side, to guard human dignity, to lend a compassionate hand, to let folks know that we are Christians. And you can see it in our actions motivated by love. May that 
be our goal, individually and corporately, especially in this time of turmoil and anxiety and fear. God's love, that's what we have to share. As you leave our worship today, go knowing that you are embraced in the steadfast love of God forever, that you are redeemed in the grace of Jesus Christ now and always, and that together we are being empowered for faithful witness and loving service this and every day of our lives. And may God's hope, peace, joy, and love abide with you always. Amen.